Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Yuka Huaye, and here's what's coming up in this edition. China relaxes some of its stringent COVID restrictions following a rare outburst of public discontent across the country. We'll speak with exiled Hong Kong activist Nathan Law. The fight against another virus continues four decades after it was discovered. We'll look at how 2.4 million people are living with HIV in India today. And a Japanese court sends a strong signal to the country's lawmakers that not allowing same-sex marriage poses a serious threat to personal dignity. Could this be a turning point or just a blip? Cities across China have rolled back some COVID restrictions, requiring less testing and allowing people to isolate at home instead of in quarantine centres. While there's been no indication that the central government is ready to change its zero-COVID approach, there has been a marked change in their official language. The authorities have been careful not to send any signal, though, that the relaxing of rules were in any way a response to rare displays of public discontent, with some protesters going as far as demanding President Xi Jinping step down. Let's cross now to London to speak with Nathan Law, a Hong Kong pro-democracy activist who was a prominent student leader during the 2014 Umbrella Movement and who went into exile just before the infamous national security law was imposed on the enclave in 2020. Nathan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been observing the recent anti-COVID protests in China. Have you noticed a marked difference in the way people are voicing dissent compared to when activism in Hong Kong was crushed by Beijing? This uprising is definitely the largest after the 1989 democratic movement and Tiananmen massacre. We've seen uh, protesters spawned uh, all over the country's uh, dozens of cities, and there are demands ranging from less strict uh, COVID control to um, a more political ones, stepping down Xi Jinping, stepping down the Chinese Communist Party. There are some some demands that share with uh, Hong Kong protests, for example, a more open society, uh, more accountability to the government. But it is also clear that uh, many of these uh, protesters in the country are focusing on the strict COVID control, and they want it to be less disturbing their lives. Yeah, as you've just mentioned, some in the West have described the recent wave of protests as the biggest threat to China's communist part, uh, leaders since the 1989 Tiananmen Square uprising. Do you agree, though? We need to assess whether China could manage and possibly disperse uh, the whole protest through the normal means that they have, for example, deploying police to arrest um, the protesters, using their propaganda, shifting the blames to some other stakeholders like local governments and also the pro uh, producers of co uh, COVID kits, etc. I don't think the current protest is up to a scale that it could shake um, the base of the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party, even though we've seen a breakthrough of how people are resisting, that their demands are really political now. Some of them is indeed targeting Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. But um, I just don't see the magnitude is massive enough to make a, a really great impact in terms of Beijing's governance and, and its legitimacy. Um and in the age of social media, some people uh, are using some creative means to protest and others turned to dating apps to secretly communicate with each other. What does this all mean? Living under a massive, sophisticated surveillance and censorship country, Chinese people, they get used to use convoluted messages to express certain discontent or messages that are banned um, in the social platform or banned by the Chinese Communist Party. So using a blank paper itself is also a very subtle way of protesting. Someone was holding a flower, someone was using mathematic equations, and um, those dating apps, uh, all, all these things are, are being deployed to circumvent to avoid from being censored. So for now, we, we, we definitely see a, a very creative way of protesting. Um, the main purpose is to protect themselves from the tracking of the Beijing government and to um, express the message, even though not seeing it, but everyone understands. 
Now, in exchange for limited political freedoms, China as a nation enjoyed a strong economic growth and President Xi Jinping has been uh, pushing to reduce inequality under the common prosperity slogan. But what's the anger that's been bubbling underneath? That tax sector social contract, which using freedom to trade with economic benefit, is now not going to convince any ordinary Chinese citizens. They've lived in lockdown for years, the economy is going worse, and they have a really high rate of youth unemployment and many other issues in the society. So for now, using the, the term of having economic betterment um, so that you guys to, to, to give up your rights and, and to give up your discontent, it is not working to these people. And that's why uh, we've seen a, a waves of protesters. Some of them are really political, but some of them, they are just trying to make a living. They're just trying to um, get rid of these COVID controls so that they could work, they could put food on the table. Um, there have been a mix of demands and mix of incentive of why people coming out. And I think that is the reason why I, that there was a perfect storm of protesting. It's really, really shocking for anyone who has been observing chi China politics um, that it is, it is control and its surveillance technology are just so sophisticated that we thought um, these kind of protests would be possibly impossible. But definitely the discontent of people, the sharing pain that they experienced in the COVID pandemic um, made these miracle happen. Nathan Law joining us from London. Thank you so much once again for speaking with us. Thank you. Four decades after it was discovered, the fight against HIV AIDS continues across the world. In India, there are 2.4 million people living with the virus today, according to government data. The pace of infections has significantly slowed down since the epidemic's peak in 2000, but health experts call for more adequate testing methods. Our team on the ground has sent this report. He's one of the most prominent AIDS activists in India. For two decades, HIV-positive Loom Gante has been campaigning for access to antiretrovirals for all infected people in the country. These tablets prevent the virus from multiplying and attacking the immune system by reducing viral loads to undetectable levels with almost no risk of transmission. My wife is HIV negative. When we get married, I said, I don't want to have children. He said, she keep on insisting. After two years, I do my viral load three times during those two times and my viral load was undetectable. Then we have a baby, we have two, two kids and they're all negative. Yeah. Since 2004, India has been providing free treatment to 1.5 million HIV-infected patients. Despite these initiatives, the epidemic is picking up again. According to a 2021 report by the Ministry of Health, there are over 2.4 million HIV-infected people in India, a figure which has been on the rise for the past five years and is underestimated by the government, according to this doctor. Many HIV tests carried out in private clinics are not included in the national count. By law, there you are supposed to report the number of cases, but then to report the number of cases, you need certain authorities to come visit you or certain authorities to get in touch with the clinic. There should be a regular um, auditing. Unfortunately, though, in the past couple of years, there hasn't been a proper follow-up at all. And often the marginalized sections of society are left out of the ambit of the healthcare system. In West Delhi, this private ambulance offers screening. No charges, no charges. Testing is all free. Anybody can take this blood test. This 23-year-old man voluntarily came for tests. So, uh, Are you doing it for the first time? the HIV test before. I've only done blood tests and HIV tests for the first time. Within seconds, the results came out. He's positive. The NGO aims to screen people at high risk of contracting HIV. Sex workers and their clients, drug users or migrant workers coming from rural areas. People don't want to go into their own hospitals nearby their homes to get HIV tested because of the big stigma. We actually have to go to the field and do the HIV test. So this is service at their doorstep, I can say, or on the way back home or at the cruising sites. The government aims to completely eradicate the HIV AIDS epidemic by 2030, an ambitious plan that seems hard to achieve. 
Japan is the only country among the G7 industrial nations that does not legally recognize same-sex marriage. A court ruling was delivered recently, this time by the district court in the capital, Tokyo. While the judges stopped short of deeming the ban outright unconstitutional, they said that the lack of legal protection for same-sex families posed a serious threat to their personal dignity guaranteed by the Constitution. Catherine Clifford reports. Applause outside Tokyo District Court for these plaintiffs. They demanded some 7,000 euros each in damages, saying Japan's current law, which defines marriage as the mutual consent of both sexes, discriminated against them by depriving them of the same economic and legal benefits that heterosexual couples enjoy through marriage. Their case was rejected. The court said the government's lack of legislative action is not illegal, but it also said Japan's lack of law to protect the rights of same-sex couples to marry and become families violates the constitution. The plaintiffs and their lawyers described the ruling as groundbreaking. I was worried at first, but once I heard them say in the verdict that it's unconstitutional, I was relieved. The judges emphasized the traditional family values to some extent, but they also touched upon the trouble this poses to those who have same-sex partners. There was progress. Although the judiciary delegated to the lawmakers, I hope that they will actively consider same-sex marriage. We will continue our efforts. The Tokyo ruling is seen as carrying weight because of the capital's influence on the rest of the country. The case was closely watched in a country still largely bound by traditional gender roles and family values. Though this is slowly changing, a 2021 survey showed 57% of the public was in favour of same-sex marriage. This was the third of five similar lawsuits filed in 2019 around the country and followed two divisive verdicts in Japan. Hopes were raised by a ruling in the city of Sapporo in 2021, declaring the ban on same-sex unions unconstitutional. But another decision in Osaka later upheld the ban. Japan is the only G7 nation that doesn't allow same-sex marriage. That's it for this edition of Access Asia. Do stay tuned for more world news coming up here on France 24.